thinking this morning about uh, new wine, new wineskins, and also thinking about old wine, old wineskins. And that uh, brought to mind the, uh, the idea of Bible, as Bibles and Bible translations, because translation of the Bible continues apace, and no one Bible translation or version fits the needs of every moment. Uh, I have a little pile of Bibles beside me here, as we all have, I'm sure. Let me just run through them with you quickly, indicating that the, the Word of God is ever vital and that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. We don't throw out all the old Bibles because the, the new best translation is in town, but we hold on to them, not just for sentimental reasons, but for, for other technical reasons. The first one I have here is the uh, New Testament and Psalms Bible, which I was given when I was uh, ordained deacon in 2000. And five. It's a version which dates from 1979. It's a, it's the Revised Standard Version from the early 50s, which then was revised. The next one I have from the from the pile is my old uh, King James Version, uh, which of course dates from 1611, and w from, for which we all have a lot of affection. And uh, this one I bought myself as the first Bible I ever bought when I was in third form in school. The one after that, also very important Bible, it's the uh, Good News Bible, which uh, uh, the minister presented to Sally and me when we were married in 1984. And so that has, uh, well, uh, it's, it's a tatty copy because it was used so much as many of our favorite Bibles are, but it uh, still has pride of place in the collection. The next one is the uh, New English Bible. Notice how the word new comes up in quite a few of these titles. New English Bible from 1961, which is a kind of family heirloom of my wife's family as well from uh, Lurgan. And then the next one I have is the, the original, so to speak, RSV from 1952, which I bought for myself when I was uh, studying uh, RE uh, uh, at school for O-Level. So uh, it even has my name, Robert Cotter, uh, form four in the front of it. The next one, just in order of size, is the, uh, well, it's the one I was given when I was ordained to the priesthood in 2006, and it's the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version uh, of 1992. And uh, again, it is bound in new skins in Moroccan leather. And then finally, that's just toppled over, finally, uh, I... Uh, just refer to the NIV, the New International Version, dating from 1979, which I I am currently working my way through. It sits on my desk all the time, and it's in a lovely uh, leather cover, I think, made in Nigeria, and with lovely pictures on it. So we all have our collection of, I'm sure, many many Bibles, and the one I have downstairs uh, in the bedroom is currently the Message, uh, which also I'm very fond of. Uh, um, um, prepared by the great uh, Eugene Peterson, who died there just in 2018, published first in uh, 2002. So we have uh, lots of new wine, and we have lots of old wine. As uh, when when to use them, and to think wha what the situation is. And quite often, when I'm preparing sermons, I find myself referring to a number of different versions. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Reverend Bob Cotter here, and welcome to our service of morning prayer two for the second Sunday before Lent. Begin with a verse of scripture from Isaiah 42, verse 10. Sing to the Lord a new song. Continue on page 101. The Lord be with you and also with you. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, to pray that in the power of his Spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done, by what we have failed to do. 
we are truly sorry. Repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past. Grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth will proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Continue with our first canticle, which is Venite, verses 1 to 7, to be found on page 103. O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, and he made it, his hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is the Lord our God. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Now I turn to our Old Testament lesson, which is from Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 to 20. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will sing as in the days of her youth, as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. I will remove the names of the bowels from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creatures that move along the ground. Bow and sword and battle I will abolish from the land so that all may lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice, in love and compassion. I will betroth you in faithfulness, and you will acknowledge the Lord. Now turn to our psalm, which is Psalm 103, verses 1 to 13, and then verse 22. And this psalm can be found on page 709. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your infirmities, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with faithful love and compassion, who satisfies you with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. The Lord executes righteousness and just judgment for all who are oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses and his works to the children of Israel. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great kindness. He will not always accuse us, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, God rewarded us according to our wickedness. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy upon those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he set our sins from us. 
the Father has compassion on his children, so is the Lord merciful to those who fear him. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Our uh, second canticle is uh, the Song of Isaiah. It can be found on page 132. Christ Jesus was in the form of God, but he did not cling to equality with God. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and was born in our human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We now turn to our Gospel reading, which is from Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 20. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, began to teach them, and he walk as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast when he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, who pours new wine into new wineskins?
So this morning we're clearly thinking about the whole idea of newness. There's a feeling of innovation, of a contrast between what is old and what is new, of an idea that things need to be replaced, need to be updated, need to be transformed in some way. And of course, Scripture is full of the whole idea of the need for renewal, but it's not the same as uh, casting out all that was there previously. We can think even of uh, books like Genesis, where, uh, yes, we have the flood, yes, we have a small group of people saved and a, a representative collection of animals in the ark for a, uh, a new start, but... Uh, also remember that it was a, uh, a selection of the previous people who were in that ark and a selection of the animals who had previously been about as well. So a renewal of the earth has been undergone. The waters of the flood have refreshed everything. And that, of course, was a one-off event uh, from which, after which God gave us the gift of the rainbow, saying that never again would such... Uh, uh, catastrophic change be initiated. So we need to be careful about how we read some of the scriptures, which uh, are readily taken up at times by us who wish to see very, very radical changes. But uh, let me start with a few um, little verses from Isaiah. Um, I chose Isaiah. Not only is uh, it the probably the greatest of the Old Testament prophetic books, but um, it's also the one which is uh, referred to most in the New Testament. It's one which Jesus is very aware of, and so many of the other uh, gospel uh, and epistle writers are very aware of. Apart from the Psalms, which would be the second most quoted Old Testament book, Isaiah is definitely up there. So if we take uh, a number of verses from Isaiah, uh, the one I use at the beginning from Isaiah 42, verse 10, Sing to the Lord a new song. And then in the next chapter, verse, 40, uh, verse 19 of chapter 43, See, I am doing a new thing. And a few chapters later in Isaiah 48, verse 6, From now on I will tell you of new things. And then from chapter 65, verse 17, I will create new heavens and a new earth. Uh, that image, of course, which we know particularly from the book of Revelation, but uh, Revelation is, of course, echoing Isaiah. So, Scripture is always about renewal, about re-energizing, about revisiting the old patterns, and seeing how they can be made better, how perhaps people can live lives which are more authentic in terms of those old patterns, or whether there have perhaps been accretions over the years which need to be removed so that the, the clarity of the original vision can be uh, better appreciated. It's that whole balance between tradition and innovation. Tradition, of course, from the Latin to uh, give... Uh, give away, to, to pass on, to hand on uh, from what is the best in the past uh, to, uh, to a future where things uh, need to be tweaked, need to be uh, changed to fit in with, uh, well, with all sorts of changes happening in, in the world around. But the, uh, the difficult thing is deciding what are the, the, the important changes to make and resisting the impulse uh, repeatedly throughout history to uh, just throw out the baby with the bathwater. Now, of course, there have been a, a number of occasions in the church's history when there have been massive changes. The, um, the advent of Jesus himself was a massive change to the whole thinking of the notion among the Jews of who the Messiah would be and how they should relate to God and the whole uh, business of the dealing with sin and of uh, of how God wants us to relate to one another and to live our lives, what the kingdom represents. And of course, the second big uh, change came at the uh, the Reformation or in the uh, the pre-Reformation, say among uh, the, the Hussites in the Czech Republic. Uh, but all of that uh, is relatively rare in church terms. 
more often it's not about such uh, radical shifts from an old pattern, but it's more a, an innovation in terms of renewal. So this morning, when we, we hear of uh, what appears to be very categorical language in, uh, in the gospel passage of the, uh, of the need for new wineskin, for new wine, and we have to get rid of all the, the old wineskins, we need to remember the context and the audience. Always in the gospels, we need to think of the audience and what Jesus' message is trying to say to that very particular audience. Of course, they're listening to him were Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, and people who were um, who had a vested interest in keeping things going the way that they had uh, developed over many uh, hundreds of years. Were in addition to the uh, the Ten Commandments that we know, so many hundreds more laws and regulations have been introduced to really complicate the lives of Jews. Uh, at that time. And so Jesus, when he is talking about new wine and new wineskins, uh, is more likely to be referring to all these human laws which are on top of obscuring, in effect, God's law. They are the kind of uh, the old wineskins which uh, need to be uh, replaced by um, a better version of God's original wineskin, so that the new wine, which is the new revelation, the uh, innovations which are for renewal and for re-energizing and for for uh, inspiring the church to cope with the, the new challenges, that uh, that will come not by getting rid of absolutely everything that was previously done, but with seeing what is to be retained and of then adding into that uh, what will be beneficial. And of course, the other thing to bear in mind is that uh, every situation, every church situation is different, and what works in one place will not necessarily work in another. And uh, yeah, that is one of the key things that we need to remember this morning. We thank God that there can be renewal, that we need renewal. We constantly need to, to rethink how and why we do things. But above all, we need to think of the, the content and the spirit of what we do, the reason for doing it, and, uh, and revisit that so that we can become vitalized and uh, more relevant to the, uh, the changing challenges of our times. Amen. Now continue with our prayers, which uh, begin on page 112. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen and grant her government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness, and let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, save your people, and bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and let your glory be over all the earth. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. We now turn to our collect for this, the second Sunday before Lent. You can find this collect on page 256. Almighty God, you have created the heavens and the earth and made us in your own image. Teach us to discern your hand 
in all our works, in all your works, and your likeness in all your children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns supreme over all things, now and forever. And I'll continue with a little form of intercessions from page 238. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son Jesus Christ to hear the prayers of those who ask in faith. Lord of your people, strengthen your church in all the world. Renew the life of this diocese. Bless George, our Bishop, and build us up in faith and love. Lord of creation, Look with favour on the world you have made. Guide the nations in the ways of justice and of peace. And bless Elizabeth, our Queen, and all in authority. Lord of our relationships, comfort and sustain the communities in which we live and work. Help us to love our neighbours as ourselves. Enable us to serve our families and friends and to love one another as you love us. Lord of all healing, relieve and protect those who are sick or suffering. Be with those who have any special need. Deliver all who know danger, violence or oppression. Lord of eternity, find us together in your Holy Spirit, in communion with all who, having confessed the faith, died in the peace of Christ, that we may entrust ourselves and one another and our whole life to you, Lord God, and come with all your saints to the joys of your eternal kingdom. Amen. Continue with our other morning colleagues, go before us, Lord, in all our doings, your most gracious favour, and further us with your continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name. Finally, by your mercy, attain everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we are always walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our blessing. To God, who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations for ever and ever, to the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope and may rejoice in newness of life. Amen. I'd like to finish this morning with the words of uh, an appropriate hymn, hymn number 604, may or may not be familiar to you, but great words and fit in well with the theme. It's called We Turn to Christ Anew, and it's by the famous hymn writer Timothy Dudley Smith. We turn to Christ anew, who hear his call today, his way to walk, his will pursue, his word obey, to serve him as our king and of his kingdom learn, from sin and every evil thing to him we turn. We trust in Christ to save, in him new life begins, who by his cross a ransom gave from all our sins. Our spirits strength and stay, who when all flesh is dust, will keep us in that final day. In him 
we trust. We would be true to him till earthly journeys end, whose love no passing years can dim, our changeless friend. May we who bear his name our faith and love renew to follow Christ, our single aim, and find him true.